Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bad End Podcast, episode 107. I'm your host, Kyle Cookstell, joined as always by, ooh, just kidding, Joshua Clickstow is not here today. Instead, we have a very, very, very special episode. So normally on Bad End Podcast, we talk about games. Today, that is still the case. However, I am joined by two special guests, one of which has been on Bad End Podcast before, who you might also know from such things as heterotopias in other waters and then recently announced citizen sleeper gareth damian martin's on the podcast today say hello gareth hi hello he's here uh listen you're you're a big deal but we have a bigger deal guest today you may know him as uh greg shedworks greg or the developer of the recently much critically acclaimed Sable, Greg. I don't actually know how to say your last name. I realized I should have asked you that before we started. Um, uh, Keith Riotis, that's it. Keith Riotis. Greg Keith Riotis from want. Sable uh, is on the show. Greg, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, <laughs> great to be here. So yeah. we wanted to do a podcast where uh, we talked about game development and I thought, Greg, obviously Sable just came out Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's playing it. Opinions are all over the place. So you're like in the hot seat right now for game development. (laughs) Gareth, you put out in other waters a few years ago. So it's like, it's a little, I think it's sort of mellowed out. You are working on Citizen Sleeper, but you're sort of, I actually don't know where really you are in terms of development. And then I'm obviously, for people who listen, I'm working on Cantata and we're looking to release soon TM as well. So we wanted to do a podcast where we talked, or I, I guess specifically, talked to other game developers specifically about game development and people who are in the process of putting out games or having just put out games. And so both of you obviously have a lot of stuff that's happened um, kind of in that realm. And so I just wanted to talk about it. I wanted to get it out. Greg, if you want to vent, this is the podcast, man. (laughs) (laughs) I'm usually quite diplomatic, so I have to be uh, careful. I mean, not in real life. Not in real life. Gareth could attest to that, but... um... (laughs) Yeah, so so we should we should say before like that both that Greg and I work two doors down from each other um, in the same building, and so oh, wow. that's why, yeah, we we're literally neighbors. In fact, during Sable's development, we actually worked in the same room as well. I I rented a desk in the same studio as Shedworks. So yeah, yeah. I've been kind of tagging along. Gareth, with them you're making for a bit. bad ends sound way less cool because you're like, oh, I just knew him. I wanted to be like, oh man, the clout of Bad End was so good that Greg saw it and was like, man, I got to get on Bad End. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the yeah that, was that. that was it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I just really wanted Wait, to do that introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. I'll prompt yeah, yeah. you when you're supposed to say the cool stuff. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 I wrote it down earlier. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. yeah. So, so Gareth worked with Greg. I think that that was. I think that's something. I mean, let's just talk about that. So, I just want to. I want to get into it. Um, we can talk specifics about Sable and Other Waters and Citizen Sleeper, and I don't know Cantata. Uh, maybe like maybe. a little later. But I think like, I think just from like a process perspective, um, and like game development specifically. So you two are both working out of a studio. Like, what is your process like? What does it mean to? Um, one of my first questions I actually have on the list is like how do you define game development? That can mean like a lot of different things, but I think both of you, especially, I know Gareth, Greg, I'm not so sure about you, but like from what looks like largely non-traditional backgrounds, like how would you specifically define game development? Me or Gareth? Sure, or who's who's got a, who's got a, uh, let's go with Gareth. Oh no, I was being polite. Yeah, we're also both we're also both British, so it's going to be a very polite podcast. Um, <laughs> so, no, I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. I I feel funny about things like that because I think that I come from, like you say, I come from a kind of weird background of theatre and like I guess like them like games journalism, but also like a lot most of my work that is kind of similar to game development in the past was like um, video design um for events and theater and like also kind of exhibition design and like working for an agency that did that kind of work and that's kind of in a way like more similar to game development in my brain than the other like stuff that i did like experimental literature or games journalism because Mm -hmm. it's very much like a design process and so i guess that for me like in a way making a game 
is not so different from making those things. It doesn't have like a, a rarefied place in my brain where it's like, oh yeah, making a game is special and different from other design processes. I kind of feel like I take similar paths through it and I kind of structure my time in the similar way that I would if I was working on any project. And I, th mm -hmm. I mean, I think that has in part led to be I've become slightly infamous at my publisher for, for delivering my games on time and delivering <laughs> things on time. But I genuinely think that's because I come from a theater background Greg and there is no... Greg eyes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see that from here. Um, no, the, the, the kind of... The, I'm not trying to brag, but it's more like I think it's kind of emblematic of like coming mm -hmm. from a theater background where it's like it has to go it has to go up on the day and so you actually just cut and you like work around that and you're you're constantly focused on just like okay that's the day I said I would do it and I'm going to do it on that day there is no delays and so actually like that's not necessarily like a better form of development right because it also means that I I I aggressively slash my games like as I work on them and like I'm very like I'm constantly reassessing scope like all mm -hmm. the time every week I'm thinking about scope and I'm I'm working to that trying to fit that scope into that space I've got so yeah I guess like in terms of defining game development I also guess because I work solo it's just so it's just my process like so mm -hmm. much of it is just me and me like um just working how I want to work and leaving like I leave massive gaps in my games and I don't finish stuff I just come back and finish it later it's like this is the big this is the massive I think benefit of solo development is you can just kind of like I can write a character I can be like I want like working on Citizen Sleeper I'll be like oh I want this kind of character in the game and I'll write like an introductory scene and then I'll just leave them alone because I'll know mm. that in a few months time something will reconnect with them at some point in future and then I will f like organically find ways to reintegrate them back into the story or you know I don't do that kind of like media production thing of like I sit down and I like do an outline and a synopsis and I stick to those and I follow mm -hmm. a script because I don't have to so I can work very freely uh, you know much more like a, maybe an author I think maybe some of my practices also are more because my work is so writing focused it can be quite more more like a kind of literary process of like just me sitting down and kind of like figuring stuff out and then having ideas feeding those back in and like building and building and building and just like amassing a certain volume of stuff but yeah so i don't know i don't know anything about game development basically i just <laughs> i genuinely i just know about like my process i i would have no chance of surviving in a in a triple a studio um or like i don't know i could not d direct the last of us like that would be yeah impossible for me yeah no i mean i think in a similar way uh I was never a game developer before Shedworks, but Shedworks is my first professional uh, career as well. So, I mean, we started straight from university. We graduated, uh, Daniel and I, and we kind of started Shedworks as a like internship for what we were doing. But I had studied architecture and Daniel had studied uh, comparative literature. So neither of us knew how to make games. And I mean, uh, we were making in games in my parents' shed and... Uh, I mean, literally, we had no idea what we were doing. I mean, I had some background in like 3D design and uh, some 2D art and design elements, but uh, and then architectural design. But we no, made no games with uh, buildings in them for the first like three years. <laughs> so that was useless. Uh, and, um, but, you know, I mean, we were, we were so, so raw. We were literally, I mean, we were handing USB. We didn't have any source control, so we were handing USB sticks uh of like updates to each other and like manually merging uh between us for about the first year i'd say that was like oh a good God. year of development yeah it was and there were, <laughs> there were more of us at the time it, it kind of went down down to the two of us and then back up again for sable but um yeah i mean you know those those first couple of years were just learning 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 and uh a lot of it was just going, you know, seeing what other people did, trying to learn from other indie developers. Mm. Um, Daniel did a few freelance projects. He worked on snipper clips right before mm. we started Sable. Um, so picking up bits here and there, um, uh, like how to use source control. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, so eventually we kind of worked out a process, but even on Sable, um, after having a couple years of experience, that process was chaotic in its own way in that we never expected to get the kind of response that we did so we were constantly kind of like 
planning a slightly smaller project and then finding like, okay, we got, we got some funding, we got a publisher now. Okay. Right. So now we can expand this a little bit and then quite maybe a year in or so we got this like game pass deal and then it was like, okay, now we can expand the scope even more. And you know, it meant that we delayed the game and we delayed the game, but that was also because we were like, Oh, we could, we can delay the game. Um, you know, if I think if we thought, no, we have to draw the line, then we could have figured it out. And I mean, that's kind of what happened in the last year and a half because mm. we could have done double the content. But at some point we were just like, we're gonna, we're already sick of this. We just need to get it out the door. <laughs> and um, and I mean, you know, that was part of Sable specifically is that, uh, and I remember having a discussion with someone at Xbox early on, they just said to me like, so where are you going to draw the line? And I, I was like, I, I don't know. I don't, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we kind of had to figure that out as we went along. And, um, but yeah, so, so basically kind of figuring it out as we go and hopefully the next production will be a lot more, uh, planned and straightforward <laughs> and, and kind of not with the same level of delays, but, um, but you know, that was also like, as part of the, like, I mean, we delayed a few times, but part of that is we announced so early, like I wasn't even that comfortable announcing how early we did. And then, you know, when we, when we announced, uh, we were also asked, can you give us a release date? And the initial release date was like, okay, December, 2019. And it was Maybe. like, if you slip yeah. one month, <laughs> but if you slip one month, then you're 2020 straight away. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, okay. Like, so. And then, so, so we we were like, okay, let's do a year later. And then you're December, 2020, and you have exactly the same issue. Like, <laughs> anyway, but I guess the point is showing it publicly led us to the support that we got, but in an ideal world, um, hopefully for our next project, we're announcing the project with a very clear plan to market. And, and you know, uh, then the development feels less chaotic because you're not getting, oh, we have some surprise support here. We have surprise support here. And it's like, oh, great. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, so it's been this very, so to bring it back to like processing game development and stuff um, on Sable, it was very like organic, constantly learning on the job process. Um, and I guess just as indie developers, your job is constantly like, uh, jump you know you're constantly switching hats and uh trying different roles and um this was the first game we had with buildings in it so at least i got to apply that knowledge but um yeah yeah it, it's funny i feel like you that, just ran through like 60 things i wanted to ask you about so much stuff so. <laughs> <laughs> i've done like a lot of gave, interviews recently like, really, yeah. <laughs> like you just gave like a great taste of every every little beat i think i mean one thing like I mean, so Sable, uh, for people who haven't seen it, if you're like living under a rock, it is like, a, it is a beautiful game. I, I mean, I'm so, I don't want to like get into reviews quite yet, but I do want to like, I think one thing I was reading some reviews of Sable today, just to kind of like check the pulse of the internet about it. And one thing that I think was really interesting about it, especially I think has to do with the fact that like, it's basically your first game. There was scope creep, took a long time to come out, whatever is that despite those things, I think people, like some of the criticism I read against Sable, I think treats you guys as like a huge studio or like this is your like 10th game or something. Like there's no, there's like zero give for like, oh, it's their fucking first game. Like it's not like Nintendo. It's not like even some indie studio that's making their like, you know, their fourth version of this type of thing. It's like their first thing. So people are like saying these things and I can't imagine what it's like to read that and just be like, we didn't fucking know. Like, we did, like this is our first time, man. Like, it's amazing yeah. that it runs. Like, that's like, <laughs> that's where it's like the line is. And I think like, I mean, I think even just um, something that I've like saw with, with doing like Cantata as part of Gamescom was like how far players will go to like kind of be on the journey with you, so to speak, but also like give you no leeway. Where the, I think there's a, um, like, I feel like this era of, like, kind of hedging a little bit because it's indie or something is just gone. It's like, if you're putting out a game, it has to be professional. And if you're on Steam or you're on Xbox or whatever, and, like, your game doesn't crash when it loads, you are now competing with the biggest games. And I, I'm yeah. interested sort of in Sable, like, especially because I, 
I don't know how much was there like when that first GIF hit that was like so successful. And then to sort of like find that energy where it sounds like you took a pretty clear step to say, okay, well, we're not going to be this small thing. We're going to go bigger. Like what was that sort of experience like? I think, and then I don't know, Gareth, if you have something to add to that as well, especially as someone who sounds like they don't do that, like where you're sort of, how you're drawing those lines or how you're sort of shaping the thing as it's being done. Well, I think part of, you know, making the decisions early on that we made was that we hadn't done it before. Yeah. <laughs> and now, <laughs> you know, hubris, basically, um, <laughs> foolishness, um, you know, but I think also uh, my mentality was always, uh, and it, I think was always, let's take the risk. Yeah. And rather than play it safe and, you know, that accumulates and becomes the project and, you know, it reflects in different ways. And part of that is you take some risks in terms of how long things might take and, mm -hmm. and uh, how polished it is. And I mean, you're right in that. I mean, we're judged against, especially with a publisher um, and, and launching on console, uh, you're judged against, yeah, AAA and, and triple I and whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whoever. You know, people kept talking, a difficult thing for us was people kept talking talk about Journey, for example. And it's like, that's a two hour experience, maybe a much, much bigger team. It's actually a much smaller game in a lot of ways. And it's much smaller, yeah, made. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we were trying to do writing, you know, we, you know, we're trying to, and uh, obviously it's more polished and we were making an open world game. So it, yeah, all these things accumulate and, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to do updates now. Um, we are learning and we learned a lot of lessons by doing this. Um, and I mean, but then I think some people, you know, I look at Swery's last game and like the game before and the game before that, yeah. and maybe the game before that. <laughs> and like they, <laughs> they all released at a similar level of like, they call yeah. him the king of jank, right? Like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, it's just part of the like uh, fun there. Whereas, I don't know, something about, I think, I think the combination of like, okay, it's Breath of the Wild adjacent, it's, it's Journey yeah. adjacent, it's, you know, it's all these things that are like, re oh, Shadow of Colossus, oh, it's talking, you know, and like, we don't get to have that sort of, um, that's what people are suddenly like evoking in their heads. And yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's how it is. Like, we can't, we can't run away from that. We, you know, there are pluses to that and there are negatives. Um, but, uh, yeah. I mean, someone, it, someone it, described it's... in like, in the bad end discord, someone said, um, when Sable first came out, they said that Sable is like, uh, it's like Breath of the Wild if Breath of the Wild benefited from playing Breath of the Wild, which I think was a really interesting statement to make. And I think like, I, I think like, especially some of the stuff like, I mean, you're, you are in some ways baiting those comparisons with like the stamina bar, climbing and stuff. Like I'm wondering sort of like, I don't know when you guys started on Sable, but I think especially as it sounds like you were sort of defining and drawing the lines around it. Like, did you feel like you were sort of glomming on to stuff that was working in the similar design space as you were producing it? Or were you like, oh fuck, like they just did that and we were doing that. And now we're gonna like have to work with the Breath of the Wild comparison. like. Because obviously Breath of the Wild yeah. didn't invent stamina meters in order to invent durability. Like those have existed for a very long time. But like the, yeah. you know, I don't know if you could that have That was a tough thing. That, yeah, yeah. Like in, that was you, a tough thing. It, I, I, you're right. Like we did bait. We knew we were baiting those <laughs> comparisons. And I mean, uh, I remember the first reveal for Breath of the Wild. And we had, we kind of had idea for what Sable would be for yeah. about a year before yeah, that yeah. game came out. And it came out, it, it got re uh, shown or announced. And I remember we, we both said, fuck, like, uh, <laughs> what's the point? Like, we're, there's no point in us making, like, you know, they're doing it, they're doing it way better than we could ever dream of doing it. And, uh, but then I think it turned, it turned that conversation and we kind of saw it as an opportunity, like it gave us a, a kind of paradigm through which to right, talk right, about right. the game. But also we realised it would solve a lot of problems for us. So like, things just usability things that they had solved we could learn from right. and i mean that's true for like loads of video games but um but some of the you know the climbing and the gliding stuff for example um you know i'm i'm 
we knew we wanted some form of climbing, but maybe not necessarily that quite that free form, but it fit us and it fit what we wanted to do and it fit the right. themes of what we were going after. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, we thought, we thought we'd have enough t- like to distinguish ourselves just tonally, just uh, aesthetically, just in terms of the, the kind of uh, sense that, you know, the feelings that the game would give you. So I think we were hoping to differentiate ourselves in that way. And I think we did in the end um, and the lack of combat and just it's a different right, right, rhythm right. in terms of what the game delivers, I think. Um, although it's hard for me to experience that. Um, that's <laughs> what I've kind of, that's what I've kind of just got flying the around impression of. Mode, yeah. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, I would, yeah, it's, it's very hard. We, we literally had no idea before we released. I, I, I must have said to Gareth before we released, I said, no idea what people are going to think of this game. Not a clue. And, this is so uh, crazy. Like, I, I, want, I just want to pause you there because this is a thing that I have heard so often from creators. And I'm like, you're blowing smoke up my ass. Like, obviously, you know. And then, like, having worked on Cantata and just stared at it so close for so long, I have no fucking idea. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, all yeah. I can see is what this thing is supposed to be based on like the roadmap. I do not know if it is good anymore. And I, for people who are listening to this podcast, like I really can't drive home this thing that Greg is talking about is so real. Where it's, I think it's very easy for people who just receive something, like to understand that the creator knows how good or bad it will be. I think you have some indicators, right? You have wish lists, whatever. But even then, that those can even be like you know, they can be like a bad indicator based on like a million different other things. And I think to like realize that for, especially game creators, staring at something for so long and then releasing it, you're just like, I have no idea. I think especially because we can talk about this a little later, like it's working in game development is so weird because there is not in the same way that there's a discussion about like film production or whatever that can be very specific about the stuff of making films that I think builds this idea of solidarity and like um like associativeness to say like okay well they did that and I did this and it's roughly the same and I can feel this way gain development can really quickly go to this place where you feel like you were just alone you were alone because all of your problems are so specific to what you're specifically doing that it is hard to find any comparable thing person idea that is doing something in the same way you're doing it and it just like you feel like you just have blinders on which is like very, very, very crazy. Gareth, I don't know how you're just doing this alone. That seems crazy. Cause I'm like, if I don't have, if I don't have a team, I'd be like, I have, I will get lost, you know? Like I can't imagine doing that. Like, um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, was, I have Greg yeah. down the hall, so that's, <laughs> it. that's my team. Greg. <laughs> I got Greg and Daniel down the hall. Yeah. That's, no, I mean, that's part of why it's so attractive to like come and that's why I was like, can I come and work at a desk in your studio? Because yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's so, yeah, it's so hard to know. It's so, it's really, and I think also, also all of us here are kind of, to varying degrees, like experimental designers. Like when we, the intention is not to like make something in a formula necessarily, but like I think yeah, it's not like three, a workmanship type design. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like some game developers, I think really do. They're like, yeah, I'm just going to make like a very polished version of like this thing that already like, exists almost like 90 percent of it in the world right and that that's i think it's totally viable Mm -hmm. but it's just not the way my brain works and i don't think it's the way that that greg's brain works and looking at cantata i don't think it's the way your brain works either like none of of these games that we've made are like easy games to make i think and the all games are obviously hard to make but they're like yeah you get to that point i mean i had this really early on in other waters where i was just like i'm gonna make a metroid game and i don't want any of those stupid doors like uh, you know that like where they're like a really you know they're really like um break the immersion because they're just like why would there be all these stupid doors with different colors that are open by different guns and then you get like half six months into that and then you're like oh fuck like i really i know why they had the doors like i i know why they have those doors um I just like keep funneling like... myself in Cantata to being like, oh, that's why it's just minerals and Vespian gas. That's why they didn't do <laughs> supply lines. That's why they only have two resources instead of 15. Because, fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why they have stamina yeah. meters, right? Like, oh, that's why. I think there's like, um, 
I want. I sorry, I interrupted you earlier, Greg. I think the, the thing I was wanted to say about what you were saying too, like that sort of anxiety of seeing Breath of the Wild, like for for Cantata, I was like the only like Advance Wars game in town for like five years. War Group got announced, and I was like, "Fuck!" Like mm. that. Yeah. That's that's it. Like that's the thing. And then what I saw, and I, what I feel like I saw again, like channeling the critical reception of Sable, is that what what these things have done is not like. I don't think that indie game development is like a zero sum game where like the three of us are fighting each other. I think what happens, especially for AAA is that like it or not, what these things do is actually sort of prime the pump in some ways and like grow the pot. Like, I think that maybe yeah. there is like a one-to-one -one between like Horizon Zero Dawn and like Far Cry and those people are fighting for eyes. But I think what happens for us is that we get to sort of live downstream of some of these bigger changes where like, I don't, I mean, what does a world without Breath of the Wild look like for Sable, right? Like you might have 10X less the audience size because people are not, like it takes something like Legend of Zelda to say like, hey, it's okay to have a quiet open world game. And then if you live downstream of that or like that doesn't happen, the pitch for Sable then becomes like so much harder. It's, which yeah. is I think like- I think that was, that yeah. was the biggest thing for us, for sure. Like just having that, uh, that tool to communicate in a mm -hmm, way mm -hmm. what part of the game was, you know, even in just like extremely reductive, broad terms, uh, you know, in a meeting, sometimes you just need to have that and you need to just be, be able to get your idea across. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, we looked at a lot at like Shadow of the Colossus, Horizon was another one we looked at, right. we looked at, you know, so many, so many different projects, but actually our, our game references were, um, they weren't the ones in the forefront of our mind whilst making the game. I'd say, you know, I pulled a lot more from architecture, a lot more from, uh, yeah, graphic novels and anime, you know, mm -hmm. like Studio Ghibli, those sorts of visual references. Uh, but, but maybe that's also because the like inbuilt, like game knowledge, you know, I play games all the time anyway, so I don't actually have to actively look at them because it's just filtering through constantly. So, I think even the way when we talk about it and when we discuss games like we're not usually referencing like other video games quite as much as uh maybe you would think but maybe when you're just you have to communicate to someone else who you don't know as well then you're pulling from those references and yeah i think yeah like you said that like you know showing someone the game the first time i mean our whole game was just about discovery right. so like i feel like even more it was there were, you know, there were times even early on where I've done a block out for a level or whatever, and I'm really trying to hide it from Daniel. I'm like, no, I need, I need you as fresh as possible on this. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's, you only get that once. And then after that, okay. And there were, there were levels where I would hide it. I, I progress through the team and I'd be like, okay, Daniel, you're allowed to see it now. I'm going to react to your feedback. And then Jordan, you're allowed to see it now. And I'm going to react to your feedback. And, and you know, and then and then you you've used your chances with those people, and then uh, and then you have to find other people outside the project, or you have to. <laughs> but you you the thing the nice thing is I guess the more you do that by the end you're able to you know the tricks you're like okay mm -hmm. if I do this or I do that then then it'll create this sort of feeling and you can make a level or a, an experience in a in a much shorter period of time um, and it be much more effective, but. That's the problem with games, right? You are learning how to make that game. And by the end of it, you're the yeah. best. You're, you've got a, a degree, a master's degree in making that specific game, but you don't have to make it anymore and you don't <laughs> yeah. want to fucking make it anymore. Yeah, and you don't want to touch so, it. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is, like, yeah. I mean, this so, is like something that's really funny about ideas and just like, yeah, just like game cycles of production, right? Like, I don't know like when you had the idea for Sable, but there's this thing with games that I think that both of you can like, um, like, like, uh, like recognize and, and sort of like, I don't know, hate in some degree where, because games take so long, they represent this part of you that existed like five, 10 years ago. Like, it's like, I don't know when you guys came up with Sable, but you're like, oh, this idea was a really cool idea when I was 23. I'm now like 29 and I'm still working on this fucking game and I'm a different person now, damn it. Like I'm not, defined by these same things but you have to like carry it through so you start to like i mean you don't start to resent the idea but it really feels like sort of getting rid of it it does not feel like this sort of moment necessarily of like generativeness it feels like 
okay, this is done. Like it's just out of the way. Yeah. And then players, you know, review bomb you on steam and you have to like make it better or whatever. <laughs> like, well, that's the problem. You still have to work on it. You still have to work on it. You don't want to work on it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're still, you know, we're still looking at like another, I don't know, six months or whatever, at least I'd, I'd say, you know, just, just keep you on doing yeah, stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, uh, we'll, you know, we'll take a little break and, you know, uh, rest a bit, but you, it, yeah, it really did feel like we needed to purge this shit and like get it <laughs> fucking out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I think, I think Daniel would, would agree to that. Um, I think him more than me in some ways, um, but we were, we were exhausted by the end. I mean, yeah. we were just, and I mean, that's the case, I think for, I think even if you've not really pushed yourself and, I mean, we had a lot of problems with COVID and production and, you know, it caused, it caused some, a lot of disruption with our team because of the way we had structured it just, just before the pandemic hit, we kind of planned like to have this shared space and then we had to readapt again mm. and that was very difficult. And so we were really exhausted from that as well. And just the emotional exhaustion. I mean, I kind of knew it was coming from previous games we'd launched and I mean, previous games we'd launched, uh, had done nothing really when you release them it's like it's 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 horrible like it's a really horrible experience to release a video game i think uh and we knew this one would have you know actually have people playing it and actually have people i'd heard of reviewing it well like i think like you Uh, guys like the like sable i think sort of for me especially like you like you guys and ooblets sort of like defined like twitter gif marketing strategy like you started that and we're still like the biggest people to do that and i can't imagine like that sort of burden that comes from that we're like yeah it's really great that we have like all these likes on a prototype but we now unfortunately have eighty thousand people who are interested in what the rest of this game looks like like it feels like the sort of devil's bargain to like take in that moment not that you knew right like I feel like that was sort of a new I would have phenomenon. taken it. I would have taken it at that time. <laughs> we, nobody cared. Nobody cared. I mean, I had yeah. 600 followers before we started yeah. posting those gifts. And yeah, like it was, nobody cared. It was very hard. And it, I I mean, even now, I don't really feel like part of the games industry, even though I, I am, I must be at this point. But, you know, especially then, I was just like, we're just looking in. Like, <laughs> no, no one knows who we are. No no one like cares about what we're making and you're kind of, and there's a, there's a feeling I think uh, that I found, I found the, the most difficult part was like, you, you know, those 600 followers, how many of them are other indie developers trying to sell you their game? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like, you're trying to sell them your game. <laughs> and like, it, it was, it was like, I want to scream. Like, I want to <laughs> scream so loud. Like it, it, but you, you, you're just having to, you know, plug away and keep going and, and just hope that one day something comes. And it's, you know, I th- this game was definitely, I think, I think this was our like thing. It was like, if we, if this doesn't come off, then let's just go get jobs. Let's just go, yeah. you know, I'll probably go back and do a master's degree in architecture. And Daniel probably would have been a programmer somewhere doing, he probably would have carried on in the games industry, but I, I, really don't think I would have I think my you know I was I was just really feeling like this you know nobody was going to take a chance on me as a as a designer because I had nothing under my belt and uh so the the most assured path would have been just to go back and get a degree and become an architect instead right, right, so right. um yeah it was so this was it this was it for sure um so we were very lucky we were very lucky I mean, for, for both it's of you, funny. I think, like, like why like why games? Maybe, Gareth, I don't know if you want to answer that first. Like, I think that yeah. it's such, it is such, like, a risk in that way, in a way that I think that you can, I think you can hedge your bets on a lot of stuff. Like, Gareth, if you started doing theater, like, if you have a space and you have, like, a studio or, like, a theater that has, like, some billing and email list, you can ensure, like, some people might just show up or whatever. But, like, games is it's like such a big endeavor to like sort of take that risk. Like why for both of you, like why, why, why take the risk in the first place? I think is especially with people with non-traditional backgrounds, right? It's not like either of you went to school to study game development. Like what was sort of the thing that drove you to be like, I'm going to make a video game. Yeah. I think um, it's funny because it dates right perfectly back to like the GIF era of Sable, right? Because Mm -hmm. I, 
I was finishing my PhD um, in literature. And uh, one thing that became very clear to me while doing a PhD in experimental literature is it's very hard. I, I look, so I, I also did a degree in puppetry, right? I did my, my BA in puppetry. And at the end of that degree, I was looking around and I was like, I want to make this, I had these ideas for this, this work that I thought was really interesting to do in puppetry and was kind of, I guess, like maybe a little bit radical. And I was looking around the scene around me and it was like the same 10 people. And I could see my future ahead of me. And I was like, I don't want to like, I used to refer to them as the puppet mafia because it was like, I knew I had to like kiss the ring, you know, like that. I knew I would have to do that and that would be it. And so I was like, so I, I kind of had a shot at that, but I was like, no, I'm going to do something else. And I actually went through, I worked as a games tester for Sega during that period, which was hmm. another story and like the, the worst job of all time. Um, <laughs> like really. Uh, big inspiration for Citizen Sleeper. Uh, that's how miserable game, game, being a game sister is. Um, but yeah, so like I had that once, right? And then at the end of my PhD, I was looking at experimental literature, and I was kind of getting towards producing my my book. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna like I'm gonna go to readings, and I'm gonna like work. And I just started seeing the same pattern. I was like, oh man, experimental literature is really small, and it's really hard to convince people with who read novels to read an experimental novel because. People who read novels are like, I know what I like. I like this right. kind of novel. I don't need your experimental shit. And the thing that, I, having been a games critic for a while, the thing that I was noticing in indie games was like, people really cared about experimental work. Like, people genuinely, for bad or for good, there was actually like money and there was a living. You could make a living in like, I'm doing a new thing. Or at the very least, you could like put out some shit on itch and people would actually like play it and talk to you. Um, and like me and you, Carl, obviously made like a little experimental jam game right together that like, I think if you look back in retrospect has like a lot of signature elements of, of in other waters, it's like a top down game with text. Like it, it's, I think there's like so much, um, so to me, like, yeah, it's a risk, but I, at the time I was like working freelance a lot for other people, for big productions, right? Like for this product, like the design company I worked for. We, we did stuff for like the Met Ball, right? Like we did stuff for like the big stuff. And I was looking at that big stuff. I was like, I don't care. I, this is not, it's not doing anything mm -hmm. for me. This is just high profile for the agency. I am, I'm invisible. Um, I just, yeah, like the whole thing is just not really, is not really flying. Um, so I was, I was like, this is my shot. I'm at the end of my PhD. I've got like a little bit of funding. That means I don't have to work all the time. I'm going to kickstart a, I'm going to, it was like my 30th birthday as well. I was like, I'm going to just like, it was obviously having like a quarter life crisis or whatever, or, or thir third life crisis is that a thing? Midlife crisis? Who knows? We'll see, see what it turns out like. But um, no, it was just this moment where I was like, I wanted, I'm going to take a shot. I've got to take a shot at something here because otherwise I'm going to go back to freelancing and I'm going to make other people's work for the rest of my life. Right. Um, and so I smashed together prototype for In Other Waters and I took it to Greg um as one of the first people that i showed it to and daniel and like because i i knew greg from having done a heterotopias like event with him um around architecture and and yeah and then like i literally just showed it to, to greg and daniel to be like is this like a thing could this be a thing is this real like am i completely off base because i had no clue right like I, I didn't know a single indie developer i didn't know what game development looked like i didn't know i was just like I found Playmaker and I was like, oh God, I can make things in Unity. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to take a shot at doing it. And I did it and, and Daniel and Greg were like, yeah, this seems pretty cool. And I was like, right, I'm going to... Like, I also love that like your like confirmation bias is like the two people probably like worst suited to tell you if you're like experimenting. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that's what, yeah, I, we that's what I was... It's great. And... <laughs> that's what's so funny yeah. about hearing Greg being like, I'm not part of the games industry when I was literally like, you're the only person in the games industry. I know. Like, what does that make me? <laughs> yeah. but, well, but you, you look more like part of the games industry than I did to me because you were <laughs> writing about games. You were, you know, sure. Yeah. You were actually paid by someone to play video games. Like, you know, I'm, yeah, no, I've never even re really gone to an event. And I mean, even now we've never shown a video game at an event. Uh, which is weird to say seven years in, but um, so I, again, like I guess not having those sorts of experiences where you're in that you're you know you're facing like player players are playing your game in front of you. We've never had that. Um, you know, obviously people are doing it at home now, but uh, yeah, it's kind of weird. But yeah, it was fun. It was 
it was fun having you in the shed and bringing bringing the game over and uh, yeah yeah i remember I mean, it yeah it was very cool i i think it's like it was also cool to see sable because i think that was just when the gifts were kicking off right like it was just post post gif like probably pre-signing <laughs> yeah. when like everything was just happening at once um but yeah so like for me they got, like i typed myself i also like tied myself to a kickstarter which like mm. if i hadn't got a publisher w- like would have been a terrible thing because like i would have then <laughs> i would have been trying to make in other waters for for like 30k right and yeah. like that would have been something that i would have had to do part time mm-hmm. it would have taken me twice as long minimum um i think so... that did scare me the most about in other waters like was that you did a kickstarter and i i we've we've never done anything like that and i i knew that like okay making a game like that on that budget is hard it's very hard um yeah yeah so, i mean yeah it's no. amazing that you you've managed to get it get it all i mean you've got a publisher so it, was, it worked out yeah no i was exactly i feel so i again i feel also lucky like i feel like i fell on my fell on my feet you know like i i, <laughs> I took a shot but like that shot itself was not necessarily like a great idea but like yeah i'd take it again right like i'd still take it again because of where it put me and but it's funny, you know, to hear you, Kyle, say like, oh, you know, in theatre, you've got like this or this. And it's like, it's really like talk to anybody who works anywhere else in the arts, like what you can do in games and the fact that you can make money from it is is like, I found it to be like genuinely a, a dream from that perspective. Like I know really, game developers really. like to talk down game development and like I get it. It is rough, but it's like the the space you have in game development to actually make money from making experimental design and mm-hmm. like making really like things that are like in other waters is like a really weird game right yeah. it's not it's like the most non i don't know it's like i never made it very particularly mainstream and season sleeper also feels like season sleeper is probably a bit more like obviously appealing to people but it's still kind of like a weird thing and the fact that like it was at e3 and like <laughs> I, you know it's just like so it's like a dr- it's like a weird dream to me and you're the like, fact you're that like, I, they don't know like they don't know that i'm not a real game developer i'm not going to tell yeah, them yeah exactly i don't know in know. game industry by them. i mean yeah i like i literally when when i was at res um with in other waters when it was like in the left field collection like greg rice was like playing it and i didn't recognize him i don't know if i was just tired at the end of a long res right this is how out of the game industry i i am and i was like I was chatting to him and I was like, oh, who are you with? And he literally like rotated and he was wearing like a double fine, <laughs> like crew jacket. And I was just like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, what? I'm just like, I suddenly, then when he, tu- it's like when he turned back around, it's like, I suddenly recognized him and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, like, I, I think like, uh, yeah, you can get, but get lucky. But like in, for me, games, it's like, there's so, so much potential for, doing interesting things and like actually having a shot at like getting an income on them right. versus like theater or whatever where it's like yeah i mean you, you unless you're one of five people like mm-hmm. you you have no chance of of doing experimental work and then not also right you can do it but you're going to sacrifice a lot for it right that's what i saw when i saw those scenes ahead of me when i looked at those 10 people in a room like reading experimental literature to each other like i love that work it would be my dream to do that to do the work right like that's why i did a phd in it i would love to to do experimental literature but i can actually like now put experimental literature in a video game and sell it to a lot of people and they read it and they engage with it and yeah it's not exactly the same thing but it yeah it's a very different space so for me games is like it's quite exciting um it is a big risk but for me like i guess because I, i come from a fairly established position in other media like it didn't feel if as much like a risk Mm -hmm. because it felt like the risk would be like you know sticking around to like do projection video projections on like a palace in dubai right like that was the kind of thing that was going to grind me into the ground and i would just be like i'm not like i can't do this anymore i can't just like make increasingly high profile and therefore increasingly dull work for other people for the or rest like, of my life gets done like i feel like i'm uh, greg like, greg i'm wondering if you're sort of a similar thing where it sounds like from gareth's perspective it's some something about games is that it's in some ways like a vehicle for a certain type of expression that can reach an audience like from an architecture background did you see a similar thing where you were like looking at architecture studios and being like 
Like I either go kiss someone's ring for 15 years until I like maybe become a partner or I can express the same ideas through something that can like make me money. Not, not that money has to be like the part of it, yeah. but like, is that, was that like a similar calculus for you or like how did you sort of find games? Well, I never, I never wanted to be an architect. Like uh, mm. I did the degree even reluctantly. I, I did an art foundation year, which is just like one year where you do kind of art. You get to try out different arts, basically, mm. fine art. Uh, you know, 3D design, etc. And they kind of said to me at the end of it, they kind of have a review and they said to me, we think you should study architecture. You have really good spatial understanding. And I was like, God damn it, because my dad's an architect. <laughs> uh, and so I purposely didn't think I should do it. Um, but I kind of, my understanding of architecture was very, at that time, very like to do with residential, to do with like actually practicing architecture. Where, whereas when I started to look at it on an academic level, it's much more interesting to me because it was much mm -hmm. more about ideas. It was much more about philosophy, history, and art as well. Like you could, you could represent architecture in such interesting ways um, in an academic context. But I knew, I knew the first day that I started, started my degree, I knew that wasn't where it was going to end up if I became an architect. I knew the reality of these things wasn't what you get in a, doing a degree. But I also knew that it was a great degree because I could move into other forms of design from it. Whereas I couldn't really move into architecture from, say, I did a, uh, I don't know, let's say I did a game design course. I couldn't have moved from game right, design right, right. into architecture. So for me, it was just, okay, I'm going to take what I see as this quite like, uh, bro you know, broad umbrella design course and see where I land after it. And games were just something I cared about, I guess. And, uh, something that I, I was hoping like, okay, I've got this degree in architecture. Maybe people will think that's cool and, and interesting and that can bring something unique and nobody gave a shit. Nobody <laughs> gave a shit. Uh, literally nobody. Um, but, uh, but I think what Gareth says, it kind of ties into that point, right? Like I knew the reality of what architecture is, mm -hmm. uh, as an industry, um, unless you're like really at the top level. And I think even then you're, you know, you're always working for a client. You're always doing, uh, you know, something that is quite, um, and the, the amount of money involved is so enormous and mm -hmm. the interest involved is so, you know, politic politicized and, uh, that it, it can be quite difficult. I mean, you, you can do smaller projects. I think that are really interesting and it push, push the boundaries. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, 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 and I also, you have to study another four years. I, I could just go straight into game development, whereas <laughs> I would have had to study another four years. Um, and you know, the, the, what architects get paid is, is, is not good, um, relative to the amount of work you have to do to get into right, it. Right. So all of those factors, they kind of fed in and I, yeah, I think I did think I was bringing something. I I think I thought like, oh yeah, I can bring something interesting and unique to my game design but i don't think that was what what played like out in the end your next game should be like a forensic architecture game like that's just just do it dead on just right on the head yeah yeah i mean yeah i don't know it, it's very easy to slip into like that would be a cool game idea and then realize like i'm not playing to any of my strengths and <laughs> that's kind of what sable was the first game that was like we look we we actually like this is a cool idea but also we can make this like right, we, right, uh, right, right. you know, before that I'd done like pixel art and I'd done like a voxel art and it was just, I'm not, that's not what I'm good at. That's not what I can do. Whereas the sort of art that's in Sable is actually in line a lot with like the rendering styles that I was using in architecture school. Um, so, and the things I liked as well, I think it's much easier to just push, push something when you yeah, like yeah, it. Yeah. Right. Or when you, yeah, you like, or when you think you're contributing to a thing that you like, um, but yeah, I mean, but, but I think generally speaking in terms of like, as a space, you can make some interesting experimental architecture that has like ideas in a video game much, much easier, much in a much, much quicker, much easier than you can in real life. And, uh, although, and it, it won't collapse and kill someone, but it might, uh, it might perform badly on their machine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like, do you seek out, I mean, either you, do you like seek out games that are 
sort of like adjacently interested in the same themes? Like, do you play architecture centric games? And Gareth, do you play games that have like a similar expression of like experimental poetry or literature? Or do you feel like, cause um, for me, like I, I do play a lot of strategy games, but I'm also like, like so much of that interest itself is sated by the work I do on Cantata that it's hard to feel the same drive when I play something adjacent because it's like, oh, I'll just like, I just want to make this thing. Like that's the, the, the need or so to speak is like fulfilled somewhat through the act of creation itself, less about the consumption of that thing. Or like, I feel like in that moment of consumption, I'm like, well, I'd rather do how I'm doing it here. So why don't I just keep doing that or something? Like, how do you, how do you both sort of relate to that? Like that sort of central element if I can be so like reductive to say that Greg likes architecture and Gareth likes experimental literature. Like, do you feel like you seek out stuff specifically in game spaces that states that, or like, is your own creation enough? Or do you just like look back to the source and you're like, you know, reading new like architecture theory books or whatever, like how does that sort of fit with the practice of creation? So um, I, I think that I'm like, uh, I have the game critics curse which means that I want to play everything. Sure. Like I, I spent so many years like getting code for things and like being able to kind of play like five minutes of something. So mm -hmm. I just buy, I buy far too many games and play very small amounts of all of them. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And that doesn't save me in any way or satisfy me in any way. <laughs> <laughs> it just winds me up. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. I also have my part of big, but, but I think I'm also like one of my favorite, this is a kind of esoteric, but like one of my favorite quotes is this like Francis Bacon quote where he described himself as a pulverizing machine and I and he's like he just like things go in and he pulverizes them and then they like come back out and that's his paintings and that's genuinely like how I think of myself so I quite like I surround myself with things that have need to be pulverized to put into my mm -hmm. game so like my studio for Citizen Sleeper has like I printed out a ton of like I have like Pinterest boards that like go up to a thousand pins and I print out postcards <laughs> and I stick them on my wall and I have like piles of books that I, I don't even like, they're just there as like yeah, totem exactly objects. Like yeah. to be surrounded around. by the ideas of the thing themselves. Yeah. 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 So I totally absorb that stuff. And that's, I find that super, that's actually like the part of me that working on my own projects has really like allowed me to unleash and just be like really outrageous with that. I think like I've previously talked about like this one little model radio that was like a big inspiration. It's like a Japanese 1960s radio that mm -hmm. like the industrial design was like a big influence on the dials and other words. And I like ordered a, a little like replica from Japan <laughs> and I like had it on my desk and I would just play with it like all the time. Um, so I don't know, it's not exactly answering your question, but I mean like, yeah, I'm, I'm quite like, I, I like to immerse myself in tons of stuff. So yeah, I will each. like... Yeah, I, w I will play like a ton of stuff that is similar to my to my game, right? But in like very much a research process, mm -hmm. I think like, you know, the only, I, I find it hard to be satisfied by other games, but I get really excited when I play something and it makes me want to make a game like it. Like mm -hmm. when I played Hades, I immediately like drafted out like what run based game would I make? Because I found mm -hmm. that to be like such an exciting solution to narrative design problems in run-based mm -hmm. games and so i was like that's super and so i really love that stuff like mundown when i played mundown i was just like oh i want to make a mundown immediately <laughs> so that's like my response to liking things is often yeah, just like make, wanting yeah. to make them yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. but but that's like the best feeling genuinely because like that carries for years like i don't know if i'll ever make it but like i love inside so much and i like studied that game extensively like in heterotopias and like I really want to make an inside, right? I don't know if I'll ever do it, but I want to make something. And I know by the time I get round to it, that thing will have been pulverized inside me so much that when it comes back out, like it doesn't look like inside to anybody else but me. Right. Um, so, so I don't really worry too much about that. Like the idea of like, oh, it's just my version of this because I think like, yeah, maybe, and maybe that's part of a solo process. Like you can kind of trust that like you will be the, the medium that this thing will mm -hmm. pass through. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like all kinds of stuff. But on the on the subject of like, especially like writing a literature in games, I'm a very um, bad reader in games. And so funnily enough, like I find it very skip, hard skip, to skip, play. Skip, 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 skip. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm just like, I'm a very fast reader. In it. It's like, I never let people finish. I, in fact, I was recently playing Black Book, which I'm really enjoying. 
but like the voice acting's too slow, so I turned the voice acting to Russian so that I can skip it because I don't understand it. So it just sounds more like you know, just kind of general ambient tone. It's like Animal Crossing voices, <laughs> but a real language. <laughs> I think this. I think that I sent when I sent you the first build for Sable to play, and we didn't have all the writing in at the time. But I'm pretty sure you just went. Yeah, I'm not engaging with any of the yeah. quests. I'm just gonna like go and drive up, and I was like, "Cool, like that's that's a play style, um, <laughs> not the one I needed to test, but yeah, like okay, like I guess I'll get some information from it." And then I gave it to another developer, and they did exactly the same thing, and I was like, "For fuck's sake!" Like, yeah, uh, game developers can't be trusted with that shit. Yeah, I think I, I remember like just taking a battery out into the desert to see how far I could carry the battery away from the puzzle it was supposed to be used in. <laughs> And I was having so much fun, but I don't think it was very useful for Greg. Yeah, it was all good. It was all good, but um, <laughs> but no, it did make me laugh, and it it just it just came to my mind when you said you're not a good reader in games. And I mean, in some ways, I'm similar. You know, there are some games where I will lose patience. I'm just like whatever. Um, but uh, I think also I'm similar in the process side. Like I think the surrounding myself with stuff. Um, you know, the Pinterest boards, like the really big Pinterest boards, like that's a big part of the process at the beginning of Sable was just, I have like a thousand, mm -hmm. 2000 pin Pinterest board called, I think I just called it sand. And it was just full of like aesthetic, visual concept references, architecture references. And then I had to like break that out into other ones eventually because it became so cumbersome. But, um, and books, I mean, always picking up design books, reference books, and I don't even necessarily read, like, I'm not reading the words that are in there. I'm just like, okay, where's the, like, where's the bit that's useful to me mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. And I'll go find that. And, you know, to, but I don't have the time to, like, read, actually read, sit down and be like, and, like, cover to cover this book. But, um, but I think in terms of, like, looking... So I don't see Sable as an architecture game. It's just a game that has architecture and we use it as a tool to, you know, as much as like uh, it's a, a writing game, you know, because it has writing, mm -hmm. you know, it's a reading game, you know, it's it's just a, a method of storytelling and that's an important thing that we do in the game. But um, so I wouldn't say like, so I think a lot of games that like explicitly look at architecture, they look at, or like urbanism even, it will be like city skyline or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like I can get derived joy from them, but I'm not like analyzing them whilst I'm playing them. I think the ones I do sit down and analyze are the ones that will try and tell story through architecture. So something like a, a Dishonored or a Deathloop or a Bioshock or, you know, a lot of uh, those types of games, I guess. But also, like, my favourite type of game is, is like, a Shadow of the Colossus or, you know, Persona, I think, is, what like, one of my all-timers. And, like, I think that's a game that actually tells you a lot of story just by the place that you're in. And it's not, like, representing some, like, revolutionary modern idea of what architecture could be. It's representing what architecture... It's a facsimile of what architecture is in a place but it creates such a strong sense of place that it transports you to to mm -hmm. that place. And um, I've, it's kind of related to a piece I wrote for Heterotopias, which was about um, like virtual nostalgia, like visiting a place that you've kind of, you'd been already or playing. A, so like, I remember the first time I played Assassin's Creed 2 um, and then, or was it Brotherhood? I can't remember. There's one where you're in Venice and then like, I had been to Venice and then I went to Venice again. And the thing about Venice, okay, you're playing in like, uh, is it 15th century? I can't really remember. It's like 15th century yeah, yeah. Venice? 14, 14th, yeah. I think, yeah. 14. And, um, but the thing about Venice is a lot of that stuff is still there, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. very well-retained city. And so like, you really feel like this sense of like, oh, I've been here before. Like I've, I've seen this thing before, or I, and uh, Persona had that as well, where you're like, I lived here before. You know, you didn't really, you <laughs> you know, you, but you're like, oh, I kind of, I, I was here at some point. And um, so that's the sort of stuff I really gravitate towards. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm always looking at like, like Metro Dread. We've both been talking about that constantly, you know, and how they, you know, and, and critiquing it and, 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 you know, observing it, you know, how, how spatial design is used in that game. Um, so it's something that I think, I mean, both Gareth and I have an interest in architecture and games, um, but uh, 
that's how I look at it. But then, you know, I also have an interest in experimental literature and games too, you know, like that sort of storytelling mm-hmm. as well. And so you always just keep an eye out, seeing what you can learn, seeing what you can, and seeing what works and doesn't work. Because I think that's just like, you need to retain some feeling of like, how does this work on a like emotional level? Like, okay, I see what they're doing, but is it affecting me? And how is it affecting me? Because I think, you know, video games are good at telling certain kinds of stories. So they're good at like competitive emotions. They're really good. Like no other medium I don't think is better than at expressing competitive emotions or getting out of someone competitive emotions. They're quite good at like ex- feelings of exploration or, or giving people a sense of like belonging to a place in a way that I think film, you know, isn't, is, can be good at, but I think video games actually can be really directly good at like giving the player control over how long they spend time in a place or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're quite, they're not as good as say film at, at evoking other emotions or, or books at, or literature or at evoking other emotions. And I think part of playing games is like working out like, oh wow, this evoked like an emotion that I haven't, or it, it, it did things to create these emotions in me that, um, I haven't necessarily felt before. Like, how did it do that? And you're trying mm-hmm. to break that down and work out the mechanics of like, how was you know they're like magic tricks like video games always get compared to magic tricks and they they are because you know and once you work out the magic trick it becomes so much less effective and but you know you learn you learn so much by deconstructing those elements and trying to you know see where it can apply in your work or you know if it doesn't apply how you avoid mistakes and you know so playing a bad game is is Almost as useful as playing a good game. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think like because the like, line is so thin, right? Like that the yeah. working and not working can be such like a thin thing. I think Gareth, like I think you saying like the playing five minutes or something is something like I relate to so strongly where like I've been playing video games for fucking 30 years. I mean, I'm not, I mean, technically, what, 27? I didn't play when I was born, literally. But like I've played so many video games across time and space that like if you've done that, like you can play a game for five, 10 minutes and be like, all right, I know where this is going, you know, past the intro cutscene or whatever. Like you can know what it smells like, unless it's like, I don't know, inscription just came out. So like more trick games or whatever, I think is maybe slightly different, but like you know what people are doing and you can kind of know what people are learning with. So like playing something and seeing like, why doesn't this work? Like I had an interest recently in auto chess. And so I'm like playing all the auto chess games and I'm like, why did Underlords fail? Like why, why are people, why is no one playing Underlords and everyone's playing team fight tactics or whatever. And like, you can play those things. And like, even as someone who doesn't really know the genre, you can play it for, you know, a match, which granted is like an hour in those games and be like, oh, it's because, well, in retrospect, it's easy to say, but like you can, you can do comparative analysis when you kind of know the baseline. Like, um, like Ralph Koster in his book, A Theory of Fun, which is actually like the one game book I recommend like any game designer read, talks about this concept of like game topologies, which is basically like you take a game and sort of strip away all art, strip away like literally everything that that's besides like, you know, like invisible, you know, capital G, capital O game objects moving around in space. And like you'll have a sense of what kind of game that is. And I think that it's very easy for people who aren't designers to not know how to kind of do that. And if you're someone who has peeked behind the curtain, you can very quickly say like, oh, these two things are very similar despite looking very different because they share all this lineage. And therefore in knowing that this maps to this maps to this, I can now know where like this thing stands in relationship to those and find that experience being meaningful. Kind of again, like Gary said, being a, you didn't say trash compactor because that didn't exist when Bacon was around, but like, you know, like just pulverizer. pulverizing and be like, okay, I know how to understand this. I know like what this thing is doing. I did want to, Greg, something you brought up, maybe one, one of the questions came from the Discord um, that's sort of related, which they asked, um, how much do either, either of you, uh, how much do you consider second the secondary media ecosystem, like streaming and Let's Plays, when you're designing a game? And I think specifically this idea of audience, like both of you sort of talked from a perspective of internalizing your own specific like desires wants needs from the thing that you're creating but are you sort of thinking about the reflection of that like when it's being received i know we kind of touched on this a little bit with like the breath of the wild comparison stuff but i don't know like greg specifically like when you're making it you sort of 
I'm sure you're sort of aware of some of the burden that of expectation that's coming from Sable, but are you designing thinking of that audience? Or are you still just like, I'm doing my Greg thing? Like, what is that like for you? Um, it's a mix. I think, you know, you, you have to respect that so many different people are going to play this game coming from so many different cultural, you know, just so many different backgrounds, not just, cult, you know, like might be coming from a different, like, yeah, just any sort of background, basically. Um, and so you have to kind of respect that and try and be cognizant of that, but you also have to be kind of confident and steadfast in what your vision is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but where I think I, the thing that came to mind, so like thinking about Twitch and thinking about just the broader conversations, I don't think about them specifically as like um, mediums that like, oh, Sable will look really good on Twitch or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's more what interests me a lot more and what I try to really think about uh, when we're showing the game is the conversation around Sable. So um, a lot of what we showed, we're really, really careful about how we showed it from really early on. I mean, literally from the first showing, I think I was, even the social media posts, like really trying to be disciplined about it and try and be like, okay, we're not gonna show, we're only gonna show stuff like once a month at the most new, new stuff. Um, and then eventually as the game developed, it was like, I'm only going to show stuff that's been in the game already a whole year, mm -hmm. anything. And then there were just areas of the game which were just off limits. And I was like, no, we're not showing any of that. And it got to a point where the, the trailer trailer guys at the end, towards the end of development, they were like, can we show this area? I was like, no. And they were like, please, no one will care. Just let us show it for the trailer. And I, I had to let go of some of that stuff. But I was really... So because what I wanted was when people played the game one to have that fresh experience and I, I hate it when trailers like spoil films and, yeah. and stuff that you're going to see and our game was about discovery but also I really wanted people to discover stuff that they didn't expect in the game and then have conversations between each other about that be like did you see did you see this thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then being like no what, what are you talking about like where's <laughs> that like how do I find that and and that was the conversation I really wanted because I think and it was that kind of like uh playground conversation that we had when we were you know 10 or whatever um and it was kind of pre-internet you couldn't just see everything or google everything you just had to like rely on rumors and i wanted there to be some like weird things that people would like talk about and be like what are you talking about but um you know like if someone was like missing no in pokemon is the classic mm -hmm. one right mm -hmm. like it's like okay there's this glitch in pokemon and you can like replicate and it was just like it's such a weird thing to do and but it was just like a playground rumor and someone would have to show you how to do it and like it became this social activity and this experience in itself and i think that was like i don't know if we succeeded at that but that was like something that i wanted and i think a game that did it recent well recently 10 years ago was uh fez right mm -hmm. like when all the secrets and, and i knew we were never going to do that extent of of things because uh, we just didn't we we had to make you can't make two he basically made two games right yeah he made the the main game and the second game and it was like we don't have the resources <laughs> or time to do that with this sort of game but i would have if i could have i really would have if i could have and uh yeah and, and there was like there's a big thing in the game that i really was like i'm not telling anyone it's here didn't tell any reviewers it was there um i told some people that you know I knew, but uh, just to get it to be tested, but I was like, this really isn't something I want to show ever in any marketing thing that we do. And it wasn't, it, it slipped into a trailer at some point and I was like, absolutely not, cut that out. Like, do not show that <laughs> at all. And uh, and then the other day, Gareth sent me a like clip from a podcast where they were talking about it. And it was like, yes, <laughs> like, yes. For that three seconds on that podcast, where someone said, when you get to that bit, call me, call me, let me know, I'm going to talk you through it. And it was just like, yes, like that's like f four years worth of thinking led to that moment. And it was, it, yeah, like that was a lot of the thought. So that's generally where that sort of thinking for me on Sable specifically came, came from. Um, but I don't really think too much about like, how is it going to sit on Twitch or how is it going to sit mm -hmm. on YouTube mm -hmm. or because those things are so shifting anyway, like, and I don't have that deep analysis and uh, like deep understanding of those platforms. Uh, so I don't, yeah. 
it, mm-hmm. you know, it could be totally new platform in three years time, you know, TikTok's mm-hmm. like, you know, you're seeing some games on there now and it's just, yeah, you, if you're reacting to that, you're just going to be constantly making decisions based on external factors that are, you know, you're not going to end up with something that has a lot of integrity, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, yeah. I think you say that, but I think there's one thing, the funny thing with um, Citizen Sleeper is like part of the thought process behind it was like, can I make a streamable game? in a weird way but like in a way that i think was really productive for the design actually and like it didn't it wasn't really about like as you say like i totally agree and i think games is like the worst for this as well because it's like right now you see all the people like setting up nft games or whatever right and it's like mm-hmm. what is by the time they finish those damn games like what yeah, is and NF- what are nfts even gonna be no. or like yeah it's just like no. crazy to do that but yeah, the... Pro- probably just to clarify, just for like, when I say without integrity, I mean more like if you're constantly shifting between. Yeah, that, yeah, okay, no, no. This should be, you know, obviously if you're just like, okay, we're going to make a streaming game, like it's going to work really well for this. Great. Like it's going to, you know, you've designed yeah, it, you yeah, understand yeah. it, you know, just so nobody like gets <laughs> fucked off with tweets at me. Uh, like <laughs> but uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no. Um, but yeah, the, there's, yeah, because the thing with, I noticed within Other Waters when people streamed it and were playing it. Um, and at, at Sears and Sleeper, parts parts of it were designed like before another wars came out, and parts of it were designed after. Um, but I noticed that like, oh yeah, this game doesn't work so well on streams, right? Because it's just like a lot of reading out. But then some people kind of made it work, and I started to kind of just be curious, like, oh, what does a narrative game that streams well look like? And so I started kind of watching like other people's streams. I was just kind of playing about, and I I'd like games like Cultist Simulator, I noticed, like, streamed a lot better, mm-hmm. because they have this, like, randomized, like, structure, and they have, like, these elements, and I wanted any way to make a game, like, that was way less linear, because I, like, in other words, is, I mean, in my head, it's not as linear as I think other people see it, it's, it's, like, it's a balance, right, there's, like, that path through it, but, like, actually, at any point, you can go off, and you can, mm-hmm. like, study the different creatures, and to me, like, those bits are just as important as the main plot the like through line and so in my head it was quite like a non-linear game but i could see when people played it they were like oh this is obviously the story and this is obviously the side content um which makes total sense but i was like oh i want to make a game where things like things can happen right like things feel like they can they can happen you can have that quality of like oh something just happened and i think that's what streaming really like relies on because it's all about people picking up content and making something funny or cool out of something that happens in the game right and it's like that's what streamers are incredibly good like experienced streamers are incredibly good at like seeing there's a where those gap like where those where the game has a bit of play like it has something you can push on like Mm -hmm. if you can pick up a you know if you can like pick up bottles then streamers will do things be like i'm gonna pick up all the bottles in this game and i'm gonna (laughs) take them all back to the same (laughs) shelf and i'm gonna line them up on that shelf and that's like it's it makes really good content right and it's it's not so dissimilar to some of the stuff I do in Heterotopias as well, where it's like, what what can I find in this game that's interesting um, to like pick at and get somewhere with? So with Citizen Sleeper, some of the design was was very much like, I w- like with the dice system of like you get new dice every day um, to like and then allow people to choose what they do with that dice. It's like I could imagine a streamer. Like, I, I realized the other day I was thinking about solo RPGs, and you could totally play Citizen Sleeper as, like, a journaling game, mm-hmm. right? You could, mm-hmm. you, at the end of each day in Citizen Sleeper, you could write down what you did in that day, and you could narrativize all the events, because the events are very much like, okay, I've got a six, I'm going to assign that to this job that I really want to go well, um, but now I've only got, like, a one left, and I'm going to, like, I'm going to use it on this, like, working at this bar, this shitty bar over here, and they're like, oh, that went badly, right? And so, like... There's, it's very simple interactions, but it creates like a narrative and a lot of kind of, not a lot, but like a bit of play for people to kind of pick up on. So I'm super, I'm actually going to be watching like really carefully when it comes out to see like, does anybody pick that up? Does mm-hmm. that like, how does it stream versus in the waters? Because now with Under the Waters being out for so long, I've been able to see like a lot of Let's Plays, um, a lot of streams. There's like this great Japanese VTuber who's doing this series where... They have like a little animated AI and they like, <laughs> obviously the AI never speaks in the game and they like voice the AI talking and then like Ellery talking and the AI talking. And it's, oh I wish God. I could speak Japanese because it seems like so funny and clever. And they have this cool like sequence at the end of the each episode where the, the, the person doing it like 
draws the creatures as they think they should look and then compares them with my drawings of the creatures that are in the game. And it's just like the whole thing is super cool. Um, I feel like almost honored that somebody bothered to like do this whole thing, um, which obviously took like everything's beautifully done. Like they've made like they've matched the UI and all of the visuals and stuff and all the colors. And so, yeah, I do. I do find myself being interested in that, I guess, but not necessarily as like, oh, because it will sell more copies of the game. Mm -hmm. But because it's something visible that I can see and it's something where I can see like, oh, this will make the game actually like better for all players because players will like there's more I, like I'm trying to make a little more space for them in the game. Right. Like more more space to hang out. I, I think that's just my tendency. I, I like games where you can just kind of hang out in them as well. Like if you want um, the game I always talk about and play far too much is Destiny. And like at the end of every Destiny session. I literally just like sit in the tower and like go through my inventory and then also just like look, look at the city. And I, I will like, I can waste like, I don't know, like half an hour there. Just like, <laughs> just also just like processing all the things that happened. Like if, it, you know, if there's like stuff that's happened in the story, right. Just like, um, and I love that in games. I think this is like one of the coolest things about games. Like we, like you were comparing them to cinema before Greg is like, that's something you can't actually do. Right. Like I love, I went to see Hellboy 2 in the cinema twice because of the, like, troll market scene. Because, like, that troll market is just, like, the most incredible pile of, like, practical special effects this and creature why designs. the and... best part of the whole new Star Wars franchise is the casino yeah. scene. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's, it's like, like all amazing. That, yeah. You're like, oh, this is a real... It feels like there's this... Um, uh, Mark Rosewater, who is the designer of Magic, he did this like GDC talk that I'm sure you two have seen recommended a million times on YouTube. Yeah, probably. If you watch any YouTube videos, and one of his one of his like it's like 20 years, 20 lessons learned. And one of the lessons he talks about is that specifically that like players fall in love with details. So it's like I think that that's like that's not I wouldn't even say it's necessarily the sign of like a really good design, but it is a sign of someone who considers the space of their game. Like I think having these like i actually like the thing you're talking about gareth where you were carrying the battery and stable like out into the desert like that's a that's a moment to sort of fall in love with in a way that a game that doesn't allow for sort of emergent physics interactions or whatever is like would have that thing so you like you basically open up these little places for people to sort of like pour their self into like i remember for cantata so right before gamescom i was like we have to add in the ability to change the names of your units like it seems so stupid it does not like it is it was like so down on the bottom of the priority list but i was like we need that because that is something where people can like pour themselves into and like fucking sure enough like we go to twitch people realize that the first thing they do is they're like all right who's in chat blah, 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 blah. name everybody in chat it creates a narrative yeah. like it's it's especially for something that's as rigid as a strategy game like any of those details that you can add to something like are those things that people will pick up on and i think like you know, people will find these things and find ways to fall in love like with these games and like, oh, there's like all these like this stuff. And I think it, like I said, it's really not an indicator of like a good game, but I think it's very much an indicator of someone like you two kind of being aware of the fact that people are playing the game and they want to like have an emotional attachment or relationship to it. And so giving them those things and then like, I don't know, more is more, but also more could be better because it produces different opportunities for people to sort of engage with this thing that could be also totally perpendicular to the actual like goal of the game, right? Like sitting in a tower in Destiny, Destiny being like, you know, the biggest content mill there ever was is almost like an anti-pattern. It is not something that is even on the course of what you should be doing, but in like doing it, you're still you're building a relationship with that thing and you're choosing to sort of play it, so to speak, how you like. And having those affordances, I think, are like super, super key. I think we were talking about this the other day because I found, um, uh, or maybe Greg, I don't, uh, maybe I just saw it through Greg's Twitter, but like a guy playing buckets in um, Sable. Oh, yeah. It's like a, <laughs> a little game that somebody invented to like throw buckets and then how they landed, you got different yeah. points. Um, so, yeah, we were literally talking about this the other day. Yeah, they they'd like done a whole narrative series with the bucket as well, taking the bucket to a building oh that looked like a bucket, and it had like subtitles. It was like, "Is that my dad?" The bucket was saying, "As <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> this is cool." Like, no, I mean, I think I think the uh, 
the other thing I was going to say is you you actually watch people streaming your game, Gareth. I I can't do it. I can't. <laughs> like I. You will yeah, eventually. Too much. Uh, th- eventually. Th- that um... is because that is yeah. I couldn't for six yeah. months. I could. I couldn't yeah. for six months. I really couldn't. I I bookmarked so many let's plays and streams, but they were so painful. I could only watch. Now nowadays, I I went back and watched them, but like yeah, no, I know yeah. what you mean. No, my girlfriend does. She finds some. She's never watched. She anyone on Twitch before, but uh, for Sable, she's been watching some and being like, yeah, here's some notes from where they were having problems, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, that's yeah. amazing! But it's useful. It's useful. I can use it. But, um, I can't watch that stuff. I find it, especially. I think we know there are problems with you know bugs and whatever, and we're working to fix them. And some of them are fixed, and they're just like we need to like merge this branch and test it and like get it. And then you're like, oh, that's fixed, but it won't even be in the next patch. It'll be in the one after because. Yeah. Or like the That's fixation of people on like bugs that are like actually trivial to fix, but they're like yeah. for some reason they like fix and you're like, like that's not it doesn't matter. Like just yeah. stop looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing as well. When you're making your own game, you'll like circumnavigate the bugs. Yeah. You'll be like, Oh, that's an ugly bug. Like, I'll I'll walk if I walk slightly to the left of this rock, it won't cause that weird animation. <laughs> but just, every single learned, other person just yeah. walks straight over that yeah and you forget it's there. You forget, and you're or you you're like, and then you see the first person to play it do it, and you're like, oh, I, I knew that was there. And I, that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. There's um, a or I wanna I wanna start wrapping us down, but I have a few more questions just to like sort of um, related to this. Someone asks, um, where is it at? Uh, what's the most uh, what the fuck? I guess that worked bug or story that you have that's maybe still inside the game Try that you think. can talk about uh, <laughs> or like a I'm moment really where you're making think. something where you're like oh i guess that does it pretty well yeah i mean mo- i feel like most of that stuff happens on the technical side and like uh oh we just need to tick this box and like it does the thing like okay <laughs> that like or like oh performance is way better suddenly because i ticked this one checkbox here um <laughs> I mean, there's an amazing bug today that I posted on Twitter where um, some reason, I don't know what it is. I don't think it was anything anyone did. It was just, I was merging in another branch into my branch. And for some reason, every single NPC in the game now was holding a fish (laughs) in their right hand. (laughs) Every single NPC apart from Sable. And... (laughs) I was like, it's because you have the is and, and, holding fish box checked, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, apparently, and, and there was also an amazing one where uh, related where the default and anim- idle animation for NPCs was for some reason just replaced with an animation of them pointing to the fish they were holding. So every single NPC that was idling was just pointing to the fish that they were now holding. But then you, <laughs> you also had just like. I was just running through cutscenes to see what would happen. And so there's like a town square meeting in one of the cutscenes and just everyone's holding a fish up at the town square meeting. Uh, or like there's an idol animation of a, like, there's a clothes shop seller and she's like uh, doing something to the clo- It just looks like she's rubbing the fish across the item of clothing on a table. Uh, yeah, there are some amazing, amazing animations in that. So that was a fun one. That was, I think, the best bug I've ever seen. Uh, it was, yeah, we were laughing so hard. But um, That's a Cyberpunk 2077 bug. Yeah. Like yeah. in that game, when it first came out, all the props got shuffled. And like, I found loads of guys like smoking guns or like eating one, like guns. There was one that guns I saw where and, like, yeah. the like pathing of traffic is not off of like an individual agent model. It's like a it's just like a line and the path had somehow adjusted itself so it was going into this concrete barrier so cars would go through it and they would yeah, explode yeah, yeah. in the barrier and then keep going it's just like poof, poof, poof. you see <laughs> you like, get some amazing ones like that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's funny this is when like you this is my struggle well with like cantatas that i don't get any good bugs it's just like oh there's a bug and the fucking map doesn't render and everything's broken i don't have like physics I don't know, Gareth, you're, you're kind of between. Was there any, like, great, I don't like... know, yeah, no. My game's the same. It's like, yes, bugs it's are like, just oh, broken. Oh, yeah, the map disappeared. Just, like, and, I guess I gotta in fix other words, that again. 
<laughs> yeah. In other words, is also like, yeah, and even but even Citizen Sleeper, like Citizen Sleeper, is so like there's no little guy, right? Like it's funny. Mm-hmm. I I really didn't think I would be the person who doesn't make those games funnily enough, but I am for some reason. <laughs> I'm less and less interested in making a game about a little guy that you control with a stick. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's like weird because I love those games. Like I love Inside. I love like you know. I, and but yeah, like unfortunately, when you make those kind of games, you don't get really particularly interesting bugs. Um, yeah. You just get bugs where you're like, "Oh, I misspelled this word," or "Oh, I forgot to trigger this or, like, variable." Like the dice in the appeared in this way. slot, but it's actually being registered over in that slot. And like, oh, the, the no, best the, the best bug I had that I'm sure both of you have maybe encountered. Because do you, you both use? Well, I guess Greg, you guys use Unity, right? Yeah. So did you yeah. have the thing where um, when you click a button? the event system inside of Unity selects that button. And then, so what I would do is I would click buttons and then I'd like press the space bar to end the turn. But because the button was selected from the event system perspective, I kept double clicking buttons ending my turn. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Like it was impossible to find because Unity's event system is like kind of really, it's like impossible to basically debug. And I was like, why is all this stuff happening? I was like, oh, it's because like everything I click is like selected and then like yeah right yeah yeah yes. so you're pressing all the buttons at once or you're pressing yeah, that one button just... multiple yeah yeah God. yeah no. i mean i had like a total disaster version of like those tiny contingencies in in other waters that like when oh, we yeah. added localization for japan there was like a bit in the game where the game almost crashes and i, I didn't realize it but like basically one of the state machines in the game got stuck in a loop mm. and it always got out of that loop, but by adding like the localization system, it just affected performance just enough so that the game no longer got out of that loop. <laughs> and so I had no idea because like I hadn't changed anything in that system. And so I didn't know to look in there. Right. And so if I spent forever like trying to figure out why this thing was crashing um, until I figured out and I looked at it and it's like it was something that I'd built also like probably in the first six months of development or whatever. And so when I looked at it, I was just like, I don't know, like, like somebody else made this, base, you know, like, yeah, yeah exactly. like, I don't know what any of these things do. I'm just going to turn them on and off. Like, and that's how I found it in the end. I just like sequentially turned things on and off. And then eventually I looked at the logic and I was like, yeah, why did this ever Obviously work? Like that, this, yeah. but this, but like this, this never, this game, like this part of the game never should have worked. It, I, I don't, I still don't understand now, like why, it could it worked in the release version of the game, but it did. So it's so annoying. But yeah, I feel like that's yeah. a great. So that's answer. the kind of bug that that I live with. Yeah. Uh, another question I want to ask is, um, what do you put in your save files? What's like? <laughs> what's the data that's actually in your save file? I, I mean, I can't even really answer that because that's more Daniel's side of it. But um, I mean, we yeah, we're mostly so we're storing storing a lot of like we use like uh, scriptable objects to mm-hmm. store like lots of balls and ints and you know like lots of just those sorts of files in the unity file system and so as a designer that's what i use to like make an object work or not work or and track that across across saves and then otherwise we have all our ink stuff going on so tracking oh you guys are using ink oh, of, that, yeah cool yeah um so we're tracking that um and then, I don't know settings. I get. I'm sure there's some other stuff, but I'm like I said, it's kind of, oh, you know, I keep. I get to see a bit of the ink stuff and a bit of the, the bull values and the whatever make some of those. What but. are the bull values? Like, what do you? Is it is it like has discovered ruins equals true, or is it like? Yeah, uh, it, yeah. It's more like has open this for this door. Like, is yeah. it now open? Like, or the the power in the town, for example. There's a quest where you have to turn the power on, and so. We just use a ball value to track that across because it's it's two separate scenes um mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. there's no way of like communicating between them so we have to communicate to the you know something in the project and then and then read from that um so and then uh and also when you're debugging then it just means you have a debug button which is just like set that to true or false and you can right, right, right. run through a town yeah you don't have to do the quest every time uh, so that's it really like, nothing. <laughs> I just think that there's just like there's like a I don't know it's sort of a heterotopia's adjacent esque thought about like save files as this specifically like weird sort of 
like indicative model of truth. Like it's basically like the truth of what Sable is in some ways is represented by the contents of a save file. I don't know, Gareth, what do you, yeah. what's like the citizen sleeper save file? Well, citizen sleeper is just a save file. Like as a, mm. as a, like the save file, like citizen sleeper could be a spreadsheet. Like it, because it's yeah. so, at it's, its like core, so it is literally just like assigning numbers to, um, two things. And then those things like roll another random number and then they like output something. So the safe file in Citizen Sleeper is actually super structured around like the progression clocks. Right. And then like, but it's also a little bit wild west. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit wild west with my safe files in the sense <laughs> that there'll be some things where I'm just like, oh, I just... I'm just going to add a... F- Everything is floats. I'm terrible. Every- it's just like a ton of floats. So it's true just like... True false is just zero and one. True false, true false is just one and zero in a float. It's like absolutely outrageous Listeners, behavior, this is but- not the right way to do save files. Please don't listen to this. <laughs> this, is, this is me. Yeah, I just... Because it's just faster to do it because I've got that all set up. So yeah, sometimes yeah. I'll just be like, yeah, I just need this stupid trigger um so i'm just, just like yeah just there. name just name it and like stick a yeah this is this is because i taught myself game development but in other waters was also a little bit like this but the fun thing about in other waters is the save file is a completely editable text document but nice. we rename it to we rename it to a dot dot data uh yeah. fake <laughs> extension so that everyone looks at it and is like oh, oh, I, oh that's I not a recognizable file i can't open that can't that's some that. programmer yeah. shit so yeah if you if you na- rename the save file in other words to dot text then you can just edit the save file yourself and give yourself all the upgrades or whatever perfect um, that is game development right there that is yeah yeah dot data. We, actually yeah, it's it, encrypted it, yeah <laughs> that's it <laughs> that's what that means uh yeah <laughs> no but you reminded me actually of um again this is daniel's stuff so like i can't speak too much to it but he had actually made a system with within ink inky so the software that you write ink mm-hmm. in where we could play test a lot of the text in the game in inky so you could just play out scenarios and you could there's a like text mm-hmm. adventure version of sable <laughs> where you can you know you like go to this place and oh, then you're wow. at that place and you're like talk to this person hit this switch and it's like and using like, the same data and, underlying or something yeah no it's exactly the same data and uh you know we're just uh, uh it wasn't you have to set set up the files so a lot of the like writing that came later was just like get it in get it working in the game doesn't matter if it works with this debug system but it was for for being able to debug stuff earlier on it was it was yeah like it's a cool idea i think it's just you have to put in the effort to like actually make sure it gets set up and yeah, works yeah. with that system as well but yeah i remember that and that was yeah that's kind of fun because then you're like okay i'm going to travel to this place and see how this <laughs> and you can read it you know you get to read it like it should be whereas if the game isn't running for whatever reason or that place just doesn't exist yet or that npc doesn't exist it it works so yeah, that was that was quite cool. Um, kind of unrelated to save data exactly, but it was a way of us debugging and testing uh, All right. the writing in the game. I have one last question for you, Greg. It's a it's a it's a another Unity question, and then we'll wrap it up. Is uh is all of Sable one Unity scene, or do you split it up? No, it's split up into a lot of scenes, and that's actually been well, it was good for us early on, but it was a, it became a problem in other ways. So like stuff like the built-in unity occlusion calling system mm-hmm. you can't you, you can do across it needs scenes. to be baked and yeah. yeah exactly it's a bit of a hassle so we're having to build a custom solution for that and um i remember there was some point we were like moving because we the scale of the world we were using a procedural generation system for the terrain mm-hmm. um and there's a box that you can Wait, is, it, is it baked procedural that, or is it Remake it for every player. Yeah, it's baked. It's baked. It's baked. Okay. Um, but I mean, in the asset, it's just an asset store asset called Map Magic. I could change the seed. It's just a number, and it will <laughs> come up with a totally new terrain. Um, You're like shit. This is how- Sable Two right here, guys. It's just- yeah, yeah, <laughs> you got yeah. that seed written down on a piece of post-it it's or like something. Like <laughs> zero, next to the number three, four, two, one, six, seven. <laughs> don't forget the seven. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> number eight is bad. It's very bad. <laughs> um, 
But there's also another button which just makes it infinite. So it will load on infinitely. So you could, well, there was a version of the game early on where you could just drive off into the dunes infinitely. And there was maybe oh, wow. an idea that we could loop it somehow or we would we would actually have it so you could drive like really absurdly far infinitely and we would actually maybe have gameplay out in the like kind of wastelands, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and eventually we just gave up on that idea. But what we were having to do because of the way Unity is calculating numbers, just resetting everything to zero. So the whole, every every single asset in the game was reset to zero. And then we had to make a custom solution for like nav meshes. Like what happens mm-hmm. to your nav mesh? If all of your stuff gets reset to zero, then you have to move your nav meshes. Right. And we eventually didn't have to do that um, because we made the world and we made it a bit smaller and um, it was it was okay in the end. But um, but yeah, that was yeah. I can't remember the question now. I'm, I'm trying That's to remember great. where That's I great. started. You yeah, know, it has to be yeah. all one use. I feel like we we got from you. We got there's a, there's a text based version of Sable. The game used to have an yeah. infinite world. I know Gareth right now is probably thinking of Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor because the way they do um, Infinite World is super cool. They use this like, uh, almost imagine like a pie graph that's like split into three. And like, I don't even know how they did it. It's like some shader magic where like the world sort of feels infinite, but you're actually walking in a circle around it, even though you're going right. straight. It's like, it's crazy. So... No, I yeah. think this is great. I want to, yeah. So we've been, we're, we're, do you guys want to say anything else or do you want to wrap it up? Obviously, Greg, congratulations on Sable. I mean, it's huge. Uh, I mean, I think like, I think it goes without saying, like it, it's been sort of crazy to watch. I think Sable specifically, like from, um, from an aesthetic perspective, like in all of us, the sort of references of that feels like it has like changed, like, um, indie game aesthetics for at least the next five years. Like, I think that this sort of low poly thing was like really happening. Like Tim Reynolds, you know, God bless his soul. Like everybody did that. And then I'm seeing more games now that look like Sable, like the aesthetic impact, especially of that game is so big. I hope you guys feel, feel good. Cause it seems like you've made a dent, which is, uh, which is super cool. So. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to feel that. I don't. I don't feel that. Like people have said things, but I, I. I mean, for me, it's just like I'm just looking at our game and trying to figure out what's going on with ours. And Why you know, you get people fish? sending you. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, exactly. That's. I mean, I'm excited to see what people. You know, how people respond to it. I've seen there was one guy. Uh, I don't really use Instagram, but I follow a few random people. I don't know even know. There's this Nigerian developer who was making like these kind of funky looking kind of strange little mobile type projects for years and then like we released sable and i just saw like a post from him the other day where he's like done a sable style game and he's like he just had a thing i was like this is a ripoff of sable but i don't like the fact that it doesn't have combat so i'm adding combat to sable, sable with and he guns. Was like, yeah pretty much and it, <laughs> and it was just like amazing like i love that that reminds like, me i'm working it, on but... another waters clone with a, a speedboat so there's like a wave, you can, wake, you can wakeboard yeah. behind the boat. Like, I hope Gareth, hope nice. you're okay with that. Uh, it's a That's water cool. sports yeah. version of In Other Waters. So I would actually love to see that. I think a top-down <laughs> water sports game could totally work. Top-down, yeah. yeah. I, All right, thank you both so much for being on the podcast. Uh, we are Bad In Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at Bad In Pod. Email us at Bad In Podcast at gmail.com. We are part of the Superculture Network. Gareth here is part of Heterotopias. We've got... Uh, Gareth is doing Idea of Evil, actually on hiatus right now, but if you care about Berserk and you've been looking at that book in the back of uh, Greg's frame, we got a whole bunch of episodes of talking about Berserk, the manga specifically, not the anime. So if you're a real head, they're there for you. We also have Funland, which is a great video game magazine. And I feel like I'm missing something, but I think that's it. Oh, Bullet Points, obviously. Bullet Points <laughs> is a great... Sorry, Sorry Reed. Reed. Yeah. <laughs> Bullet Points is a great place to get all of your uh, news about video games and cool, awesome critique. Um, Again, thank you both so much. Greg, congratulations. Gareth, congratulations. And to everyone else, we will talk to you later. Bye.